What's up YouTube? So I have done several videos on how to create Cytron's baseline, but I don't think I've done one that kind of covers the everything that you need to know from A to Z, from sort of beginning to more advanced techniques and stuff. I think I kind of more focused on the sound design aspects with particular synths. And in this video, I kind of want to go through everything, the complete A to Z guide for creating Cytron's baselines. So let's dive in and have a look. Of course, like I said, there are several videos out there, including my own, that have all different types of techniques for creating different sounds and stuff. So, like I said, with this video, I kind of want to go through the more advanced stuff, like what you need to know to get the best out of that particular sound. So instead of explaining everything um, as I go through it, I'm just going to quickly go over the basics, but I'm going to explain, like I said, the more important stuff that I think makes the biggest difference. I've already got a MIDI pattern here, which I want to copy across, but for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just going to leave the notes uh, a full 1 16th length, just so I can um, outline something for you guys. And this is something that a lot of newcomers creating Cytron's bass lines often end up doing. So anyway, we've got the init patch on Serum. What we're going to want to do is just create a filter. We can turn the resonance down. Let's just create a envelope. So just because I want envelope one and two to be kind of similar in their timing, what I want to do is first set up envelope one, something like that. And then what we can do is we can just drag it over to envelope two. And here, let's assign this to the cutoff. Hold Alt Shift and click to turn it onto unipolar. And with this one, we can actually turn the sustain down somewhat. So you can see you've got a kind of difference here. This one representing the filter and this one representing the amplitude. What I'm going to do is let's just have a listen to what we're dealing with here quick. For those more advanced users out there, you probably know already what's going on. Let me just pull up a scope. We're creating a different phase setting each time the synth is re-triggered. And it's because this random phase is on max by default. So if we turn this down, you can already see we've got a much more stable sound. It's sounding much closer to a Cytron's bass line. So if you are wanting a bass with a bit more of a click, what you can do is you can turn the phase to zero. And as you can see, it starts on the downward cycle. As opposed to phase on 180 degrees, which starts on a kind of a higher part of the waveform. And it gives you kind of more of a full bodied sound. Um, whereas this is kind of more of a plucky sound. So the next thing that we need to be aware of is, if you look here, the as the note finishes, it overlaps here a little bit. So there's a ever so slight amount of sign tailing off when the next note hits. So the best way of dealing with this is in the actual MIDI. Because of course what happens is here in Serum, if we start reducing the amount of release, we're gonna start hearing a click every time the note is re-triggered. So the best way of dealing with this is, you know, in the actual MIDI, is actually reducing the length of the little MIDI notes over here. We can actually just select them all and then hold control and adjust them ever so slightly. So by simply adjusting the size of the MIDI clips, we've got a lot of control over how long those notes are. So these longer ones still have a little bit of overlap while the shorter one seems good. I want to get these second ones a bit closer to this first one. So let's actually select all of these ones. So here what I do, um, a little handy trick, is to put a kilohertz gain before and after the plugin and then boost it up and reduce it afterwards just so you can like really boost the waveform on the scope 
to see exactly what's going on in those really, really low cycles. Then we can jump back into the synth and just reduce the release ever so slightly until we've got that kind of perfect, you know, hitting zero before the next note starts or before the kick starts. And these kind of little adjustments you'll find make such a massive difference to the way that the kick and bass kind of rolls off altogether and the way it kind of glues together. Let's have a look at EQ and why, specifically for something like the bass, choosing the correct EQ is very, very important. And, you know, I think with this one, we, we're looking good with the kind of frequency or spectrum balance overall. It's sounding nice and full, but I do like to low cut the bass every time, just because you never know, the scopes might be missing some sort of low frequency rumble or something that's coming through. So that being said is a lot of the time you'll see people talking about the fact that linear phase EQ sounds better than traditional EQ and such and such. And while I think, yes, in a lot of cases it does, but one thing that I think it's it does to the low frequencies is it creates what's called pre-ringing. And I want to show you guys quickly what exactly that is. So I'm just going to load up uh, Cubase's uh, standard frequency EQ, just because this actually is pretty cool. It's got a linear phase setting on each of the channel, um, on each of the bands. So we can, for example, slap it here and click linear phase over here. So, like I said, while that the effect itself is very, very inaudible, it's very natural, you can see on the actual scopes that it's creating this little ramp before the actual waveform. And there's various ways around this. I mean, I've done this, then resampled it and uh, actually started the sample there. So you don't get that kind of pre-ring effect. But... This is actually something that's come up on my channel a few times, why um, I use a plugin called Equilibrium, um, because it's, it's quite an expensive plugin. Reason being is that it's got a setting over here. You can actually choose whether it functions in linear phase mode or various other, uh, various other settings here. But I find this full minimum is the most accurate way um, of creating EQs, uh, specifically for these low end elements so let's pop a high pass filter would it be a low cut okay so let's compare these two eqs My takeaway from this, in linear phase mode, it does sound the cleanest. However, you do get that little bit of pre-ringing. And what that does is it adds to the overlap that's coming from the previous. It's, it's almost impossible to get a incredibly stable phase in the low end when you have that kind of pre-ring effect overlapping, or it accentuates that overlap, um, should I say. However, a lot of these EQs, when you don't use linear, the linear setting, they become very, very audible, like for example with this one. And this one in that full minimum setting, I, I think it sounds the best. In examples where I'm kind of missing a little bit of that kind of really low hump, or I'm missing a kind of mid warmth, then I'll often use this uh, Paltec style EQ. This is really cool, it's actually free. Um, I'll try to remember to post a link in the description. I have done a video on it previously. The quick and easy way of setting this up for bass lines, um, I'll actually just turn this and this off because these, this is the kind of mid EQ, this is the high EQ, and I'll turn the tube emulation off, 
um, because I do want a kind of cleaner sound. I'll generally turn bandwidth all the way up. And the idea here is you're kind of boosting and attenuating. So you're turning up and turning down the EQ settings. And that creates a kind of unique hump at a specific frequency which you set here with this uh, knob over here. So we can actually have a look at that spectrum while we're playing around here with this guy. One thing with this though is it's pretty dangerous. Um, you can end up boosting a lot where you may not want to. So I sometimes jump back to the EQ, um, well the actual uh, low cut EQ and adjust where that's, where that's kind of low cutting just so that I kind of get this nice mix of the two EQs. The next important thing is sidechain. Let's put LFO tool onto the kick and bass group channel so we can get a more accurate representation of what's happening to the mix of them together. In this example, the kick is very boomy. It's got a lot of this tail after that kind of 1 16th. This is not actually doing anything to the audio for those who are interested. Generally speaking, Cytron's kicks have a little less body than this, uh, or a little less kick, uh, especially like the newer kicks. They're a little tighter, so that does allow for less sidechain, um, but the more proggy stuff has got longer kicks. So I guess it depends what kind of, uh, what kind of vibe you're going for. Um, but I think generally speaking, I do end up adding a bit of sidechain. It won't be like 100%, but I'll kind of mix it in to get the best sound, I guess. And you can see without it, what happens is you get this sharp pluck here, which is a little bit louder than this one. Whereas this is the one that you kind of want to be, or these two, you want to have the most energy. So I use that to kind of just tone that first one down a little bit. Okay, so let's look at MIDI and no choice. If your synth oscillator is octave is tuned to unity or zero, then D zero is about the lowest that I would go in the pitch. It's something like this. And then the octave of that D one is about the highest that I would go but I like somewhere around the middle here. I think this is a good uh, uh, halfway mark. But if you are using reference material, I mean, the easiest way of being able to quickly pick up, you know, what key it is, is to just play the, the bass that you've created and then move it up and down until it kind of like fits into that curve. We can see that the um, when we open up our scope of the kick and bass channel, we can see that the bass is a little bit higher in volume than the kick. And I generally like to have the kick peaking a little bit higher.
together, both of them, I like to peak at minus 12. One thing that I've explained quite a bit in my videos, um, but I do it quite often and it might be something that you may not have picked up on, is the fact that I generally transpose my midis because I find it's easier to work with because I only know what notes are in, for example, a C minor and a C major scale. So here we've picked a note of A for our root note of the bass. So what I want to do is actually just shift this back up to a C and that was three movements, one, two, three, to go from an A to a C. So what we can do here is we can go and transpose this MIDI down by three. You don't have to do this if you know your scales and stuff like that, but I just find it a little bit easier to work with because now I can go in and actually just audition random notes that I know in the scale to try create like a bit of a groove, for example. So obviously, depending on the scale that you've chosen to work with, you know, you can do various things. What I like to do, though, is here, let's create a bunch of different ones. Um, we can create different variations here. Actually, let's just duplicate this one. It'll be easier. And let's just make one red one, which is like the flat, flat variation. So here we can jump in and create like a different variation on each of these. Um, let's go with a Phrygian scale. So it's going to be C, C sharp, D sharp. F, G, G sharp, A sharp, I think. So yeah, let's just make a bunch of variations here. Have I done that? No. So obviously it's gonna be a bit wild if we just play this on loop, but the idea here is to create like flats in between each of these. Okay, well we can actually create a different variation here as well. These ones are quite nice, the up down thingy. But I mean, the idea here is to pop a bunch of these in and then drop these randomly in the spaces. I mean, you don't have to vary it so evenly, um, but this is just going to give you a good representation of, you know, how powerful this kind of technique is. So let's just go drop a bunch of these in here. Oh, I, missed, I missed one there. So then what I'll do is I'll duplicate that whole segment and just glue it together. Boom, we've got one variation. And what I'll do is I'll just create a bunch of variations and then audition, you know, which ones sound the best, you know. I think like this one could have something like that rather. So we've created four different variations there just using the little chunks that we made beforehand. So here I want to address another thing um, and that's resampling. So going back to what I was saying earlier regarding the kind of note overlaps and that kind of stuff 
and creating your notes to be a little bit smaller. I personally prefer the sound of slightly longer notes. Um, so let's go. I feel that it kind of has this like rolling sound, which sounds a bit nicer to my ear, or at least for the style of bass line, which I prefer to do, even though there is that kind of like phase overlap. So pretty much the only way I've found to avoid that is to resample the bass. What I want to do is I'm not going to do the entire process here um, just to save you guys on an uh, incredibly lengthy video. Let's turn off the LFO tool. And it doesn't matter the actual length, we can leave it like a full 1 over 16. And let's just do a small chunk like this. You've got to actually export uh, using the actual project export function here. But what I want to do is make sure it's just quite a loud volume. There we go. And export. And then let's open up this plugin, TX16WX which is a free plugin actually. And let's just close this so we've got more workspace here and I can just drag it in from here. So we wanna open this regions window and then just drag this onto the note. So I believe it was a A0 and now I've deleted that MIDI. It doesn't matter, we can just recreate it using the beginning of this one here. So let's just make sure all of these are muted and uh, we can go ahead and transpose this one as well. Okay, so I've dropped it into the wrong place. This guy needs to be one octave up over here. Cool, so let's have a look at this part over here. You've got the ability to jump to different zero crossing points and you'll see that due to the nature of the way that the program is sampling and latency and that kind of thing. There's generally a couple of snaps before that first jump. So I like to use these little nodes to find that snap before the jump, because that's like the most kind of time accurate sample spot, if that makes sense, or sample start spot. It doesn't really make that much difference, but I just like to do it for my own sanity, I guess. So then here under the sounds panel, we can actually drop these down, click on sounds. And now we can go and fine tune uh, the release, sustain, and there's actually two decay values. So you've got incredible control here. So let's reroute this one back through the kick and bass. Okay, it is. And have a look at the LFO tool here. We created the sound with that longer kind of body for the bass, but we've got a bit more control here over its kind of release parameter. So you get a li little bit more of clinical control when you resample the bass. Um, obviously when you're doing note stuff, it's a little bit difficult. You're going to have to resample each note. That being said is once you've got a couple of patches that you've made and resampled, I'm telling you, you're not really going to need to recreate a bass every single time you start a project. So let's just level this again.
so let's talk about phase and the tool that I use to correct uh, issues in the phase. For this example, I was just incredibly lucky in the fact that the baseline that, that I created and the kick sample that I used just happened to line up like perfectly with a phase. Um, let me just quickly show you an example here on the scope. So the idea, uh, essentially what phase is, is the time at which the cycles of the waveform are occurring. Here, as you can see, as the kick kind of tapers off, the phase of the baseline kind of like, it mixes in almost perfectly. It kind of looks seamless. So for the purpose of a quick explanation, I'm going to jump back into Serum and just show you quickly what happens when we adjust the phase over here. Let's set this to 180. So as you can see, what's happened is there's now a sort of offset or mismatch on those sounds. You know, it doesn't kind of seamlessly mix from the kicks waveform into the bass waveform. Say, for example, you want to use a slightly different, you know, phase setting over here. You can always correct it with a timing plugin. So the one I like to use is F8 Timeline uh, by Forward Audio. I've done a video on this one before. Uh, this is really, really cool because the increments are tiny. So it allows you for incredibly sort of clinical control over the phase relationship between the kick and the bass. Um, so usually I'll slap this on the bass channel and we can actually adjust this uh, by an amount of samples. So as you can see here, it kind of... Um, it gives you the, the maths, you know, of how many samples is equal to how many milliseconds as, and, you know, as some, some of you may or may not know, anything sort of under 25 to 35 milliseconds is actually pretty much inaudible or imperceivable to the human ear. So you've got quite a bit of control here as to, you know, shifting it forward or backwards in time. So let's actually have a look at what this is doing on the scope here. can actually adjust our maximum points as well. So using this uh, sort of time offset plugin, you've got a lot more control over how you want to align the phase of your baseline. You know, you're not necessarily, you don't have to set it to, on the plugin, how it best suits the kick, for example. You can kind of play around with it a little bit and then just adjust it on the actual channel itself. So another thing I want to talk about is transient shaping or envelope shaping, uh, or the multiband envelope shaper as it's called in Cubase. 
Uh, Waves TransX is the very other popular recommendation uh, for doing exactly this type of thing. But one thing I want to make you guys aware of is a lot of these things don't take into account the sort of destruction to your phase that happens when you do a crossover, uh, frequency crossover below 500 hertz. So I think it's between like four and 500. You'll see though when we open up a scope over here. So as soon as I put on the plugin without, you know, touching any of the settings whatsoever, you'll see that it's quite drastically changed what our actual base looks like. Uh, we can bypass it. And the effect is actually pretty audible as well. Watch what happens here when we shift this upwards. So you'll see between like 400 and 600 or so, you actually get a much closer sound to what you had in the original. And when you bypass it, the only effect is slight difference in timing. So that's one thing to be very much aware of. The first thing I'll do is set this uh, low frequency cut much higher. You know, a lot of the time people will bypass this entirely, but it'll still retain that kind of, uh, how can I say? Okay, so let's just set this back to how it was like default. I think it was like 225 around there. And if we bypass the first band, you'll see it still has that kind of effect. So it's still important to kind of move the frequency up quite a bit. And I mean, this little kind of deviation here, I don't think makes all that much difference, to be honest with you. Um, so, I mean, I guess from anywhere above like 450 or so, and you should be good. So you don't necessarily have to bypass the first band. So we've still got control here. We can add a bit of release. And then maybe add some punch in the kind of mids and tops. Let's move this down a little bit to about 3K or so, and then give it some attack. So we've talked about all the do's. Now let's talk about some of the don'ts. So this is something that's come up quite a bit lately. Um, I'm not sure if there's somebody else who's done tutorials that include this type of thing, but it seems that I've kind of picked up quite a few people using delays and reverbs on the bass. And while obviously, you know, your creativity is up to you, you can do whatever you want. But I think, you know, using uh, those more time-based effects like delays and reverbs can be quite problematic. And let's look at the delay, for example. So one thing I picked up is there was uh, quite a few people actually doing a thing where they put like a delay with two different um, kind of times. And the idea was to kind of fatten up the bass sound, almost like a chorus. that type of thing generally adds a lot of stereo
a lot of stereo to the bass, which is generally not a good thing. Instead of using stereo effects and that kind of thing on the bass, and you want to get, you know, fatness and wideness. I mean, there's a couple of things you can do, um, you know, using different oscillators, one pitched higher, so you're not actually getting the subs through to the effects and that kind of thing. But I generally, I generally like to say that the best way to create wideness is using contrast. Is if you have a very flat centered bass and wide synths around it, it's going to sound much wider than if everything is just full width. You know, the kind of effects and stuff that I would use on a bass would be, you know, stuff like distortion to maybe change the sound a little bit. Specifically, if you're going for the more traditional Psytrance bass bassline, first try and nail it, you know, nail the good mono bass and then start looking at experimenting and that kind of thing. But yeah, like I said, distortion, saturation, compression, EQ, anything that's not too much of a time-based or stereo-based effect, and you shouldn't have too many problems, uh, you know, cleaning it up and getting it to stand out in the mix. Um, as you can see here, you know, the actual fundamentals are very, very basic. It's just you know, taking the time to analyze what's actually going on there, having a look at the scope to check, you know, where they're overlapping and that kind of stuff. That's that those small things are what makes all the difference, I think. Okay, so it occurred to me that this video is a little bit jumbled because I shot it on different days and edited it kind of all together. So I should probably finish off with a little bit of a sequence uh, or a procedure at which I usually do these things. So generally speaking, I'll start at the kind of synthesis process. I usually won't synthesize a new bass sound for every track. I'll kind of create a couple of bass sounds and then use those for a bunch of different tracks using resampling and that kind of stuff. So I won't really bother about choosing the no choice and that kind of thing while I'm synthesizing the sound. What I'll do is I'll just bear in mind that I'm probably going to resample, you know, from D0 up a couple of octaves, two or three octaves to get a really good sort of range for uh, sort of uh, progressions in the bass and stuff. So I'll generally do the synthesis, make sure uh, phase is all good and that kind of stuff. And then I'll look at uh, the processing, uh, EQing. Um, remember I said I don't do too heavy EQing before I resample because I could always, you know, EQ it to fit into the specific track that it needs to fit in at that point. Then I'll go into transient shaping, multiband processing and that kind of stuff uh, before I actually resample the sound. And then I'll go ahead and resample, like I said, a couple of octaves of the sound and then look at putting it into the specific track that I'm wanting to put it into. It's at that point that I'll start looking at no choice progression and a bit more fine tune EQ to get it to fit into the specific example with that specific kick drum and stuff like that. And then again, once it's in the actual, uh, once it's in the actual track that I'm gonna be using it in, I'll double check the phase and timing and all sorts of stuff uh, with all the tools and stuff that I explained in this video. Awesome, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let me know what you think in the comments. A big thanks to IDM Mag, proud supporters of the dance music scene and my channel. I might do a couple of octaves of samples and post that to my Patreon as well uh, for all my $5 supporters. So if you wanna know what that's all about, check out the link that's gonna be on the screen right now and hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. See you guys next time.